Ready? Yeah. Here we are, Real Recovery Talk. I am your host, Tom Conrad. In today's episode, we don't have Benjamin B. It is just me. Ben's off doing some work. or So he says he's working. I don't know. He's downstairs, but he's not with us. But we do have a guest, and our guest today is Jordan. Jordan, how you doing? I'm good, man. I'm good. I just had an idea for you. I think you should get a cardboard cutout of um, him. <laughs> So we could, so when he's not able to be on the show, you just, yeah, you know, and then like we could cut to him every now and then and be like, what do you think, Ben? And then, and then just, yeah, just have a pause. That's a great idea. (laughs) That is a great idea. Hey, listen, thank you for tuning in on the podcast app, whichever one it is that you choose to use. And thank you for watching on YouTube. In the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you could always reach us, Tom at realrecoverytalk.com. And Ben at realrecoverytalk.com. And we're going to uh, ask you for your phone number and we're going to send you a text message. Hey, this is Tom from Real Recovery Talk. And you're going to say, oh my gosh, hi, Tom. And then we're going to connect and we're going to hopefully help you with your situation, whatever it is, if it's with you or for a loved one. And ultimately, we want to help you turn your mess into your message. So. That's the whole idea behind it. What do you think about that, Jordan? I think that's awesome. And I love I love that sign. So the only sign. issue with this sign is, um, and it's been brought to my attention now by a few listeners, uh, and I have to figure out how to fix this. When I put the lights up in a certain position, it reflects off of the plexiglass. Got it. So I think I'm going to have to Maybe try and... Maybe you could and- just put the... the, the uh, the neon up there and take the plexiglass off i was i was looking at how to do that and i think what i would have to do is get a heat gun because that neon is glued to it Uh, so either i have to do that or i'm gonna try and paint this plexiglass the same color as this wall because i have extra paint i have no idea if it'll work um but anyways that's my issue with the sign i love the sign it's a great sign you know but anyway, you don't know if it'll work until you try, man. You know, that's right. Well, hey, listen, um, I'm glad that you're here. And I know that uh, just before we started recording, we were kind of talking about what how how we were what direction we were going to go. And like everybody that comes on, it's organic. There's no script here. There's nothing, you sure. know, uh, so we just, you know, kick it. But tell tell, you know, so let me say this. Uh, the A lot of the people that listen to this are families and loved ones. Um, I would say probably 60 percent of our listener base is families and loved ones that have some sort of addiction or mental health in their family. I'll do my best not to curse. That's hey, it's <laughs> you know, it's it's we're for everybody. But I don't think there's really any children listening. So. Okay. All right, cool. And there's a little button that I can click that says explicit, which will let everybody know that, hey, there's some F-bombs being dropped. Yeah. We're saying some fucked up shit. Yeah. Know? Yeah. So <laughs> anyways, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you're from, kind of, you know, and then we'll just go from there. Yeah. Uh, born and raised here in sunny South Florida in Boca Raton. So been here my whole life. That's kind of a, a rarity. Um especially in the recovery world down here. A lot of people say I'm a unicorn, if you will. Yeah. Um, being born and raised down here. Uh, doesn't mean I'm not well-traveled, though. Been all over the world, which is pretty cool. Um, man, a little bit about myself. I, um, I'm very into music. I have a big musical background. Um, you know, that's kind of what's awarded me the opportunity to travel all over the country and the world. Let's uh, dive into that a little bit. And this is more for selfish reasons. Um, sure. Cause I want to, I want to, I want to know more. Uh, what do you elaborate on that as far as your music background? Yeah. So, I mean, so before you hit record, we were kind of talking about that a little bit. You asked, you said you, you would love to take drum lessons and uh, you know, everyone's <laughs> listening. I'm happy to teach you sounds good uh, but what we were talking about is how i probably wouldn't be able to teach kids i don't yeah. have the patience for that but uh yeah but yeah um i actually was like a basketball player when i was a kid my like my entire life up until i was like 14 15 and i was uh, i was playing in high school down here 
and I, I got injured and kind of ceased playing basketball for a while. And there was this lovely kid in my math class. His name was Daniel Dubsky. And he, he was like, Hey man, I know you're into punk rock music and stuff. Like, would you want to join the drum line and come play drums for our marching band? And I had never played a musical instrument before in my life, but I was like, you know what? Why not, man? I'll try it. Uh, maybe I'll do something different. You know, I was kind of sad and depressed about not playing basketball and figured something new might be helpful. So started playing in the drum line and I sucked. Like I was really, really bad. I had no rhythm and uh, it took me a while to really <laughs> catch my groove there. I was playing that big bass drum, you know, and uh, Daniel was nice enough to hang out with me after school and teach me how to play <laughs> drums and, you know, gave me my first pair of drumsticks and <clears throat> just like basketball and, you know, what you guys will find later in life, I developed a full-blown addiction to playing drums, right? Um, <coughs> bought a drum, grand, grandparents bought me a drum set, threw it in the garage, and I just practiced for hours and hours every single day and um, got to a point where my senior year of high school, uh, the band director was letting me write my own parts for stuff because I had, you know, been studying jazz and Latin rhythms and all different types of drumming. And, um, I got very good, very quick. And I ended up getting, you know, a scholarship to go play, uh, to play drums in a marching band. And, uh, threw that away. Um, when I discovered partying and rock and roll and, uh, you know, local fame, I guess, if you will, started playing in local bands down here and became obsessed with it and went away to college for a little bit and realized that school just really wasn't for me. And, um, I started touring, uh, with a lot of different artists, you know, a lot of artists that I listened to a lot growing up as well. And, um, there's actually a, a band, they have these, uh, a lyrics in one of their songs. It's, um, you know, watching my heroes turn human in front of me. And that's kind of what happened for me is I got to like watch, you know, all these guys I looked up to are now these guys that I'm hanging out with on the regular on the Vans Warp Tour. My first, I guess, major tour I did was the Vans Warp Tour in 2010. Um, and that's the tour that like really brought me to my knees um, because I'm hanging out with all these guys that are rock stars that are like out there drinking all day, doing all sorts of drugs, staying up all night. And they've been doing this for a while, but I hadn't, you know, and I just wanted to impress them. So here I am doing way more than I should be doing, you know, and, uh, making a fool of myself, if you will. How old were you then? 18. 2019. So yeah. 2010, you're on warp tour and you're, I mean, that was, I don't, I didn't go to that sure. because I got sober in 2010. Um, I went to a lot of those, a lot of those tours though, before I got sober, I'm trying to think of something, but anyways, regardless, um, that's, that's kind of crazy in the sense that like I, they, they're used to this lifestyle. Sure. You're 18. And how old were they? I mean, mid 20s or mid mid to late 20s, you know? Okay. Some and early 30s. There's a there's a big correlation there. Like you said, I hadn't been doing this. This wasn't really my type of lifestyle, maybe. I mean, partying to a certain extent, but yeah. then you're going now all of a sudden you're thrown. How did that even happen? Like just through networking and connections, you yeah. made it onto a band. And you know what's funny, man, is like I still think to this day that MySpace was the greatest social media platform we ever had. Yeah. And it, it, it helped so many people even in like, uh, like coding. Like, I don't know if you remember MySpace, but like we were like all coders and learned yeah. how to like build our page and do all that stuff. And like, we were learning all that stuff on that social media and it was still the, still to this day, the only social media platform that like bands could go on and have their page and upload their music to it. And you could listen to their music and stuff. This is before streaming platforms like Spotify, et cetera. And, um, all of the bands that I listened to 
they always had a section on their MySpace page of like who their manager <clears throat> was or things of that nature, right? So like, yes, I'm playing drums in some bands, but like also I just wanted to tour. So I was willing to work for bands, sell t-shirts, set up instruments like the, like a tech, you know, um, do production, you know, anything that I could, um, photography. I, I didn't, I'm, I'm not a photographer, but I was, I was like, man, I'll get a camera. I don't care. I just want to be on tour. I just loved, I got a taste of it and I just wanted more of it, you know, addiction, right? Um, so for Warp Tour 2010, I had just emailed all of these, like some of my favorite bands managers from MySpace and just said, Hey, I'm willing to work for next to nothing. I just want the experience to come on tour and prove myself so that like I could get jobs in the future and continue working for different artists or playing for artists, et cetera. And I got hit up by a bunch of, a bunch of the bands, you know, that were interested in having me come, but one in particular, this band called the early November was like my favorite emo band. Uh, from, they're from South Jersey and, um, their manager had reached back out to me and said that they were looking for some help on the tour. And I was like, cool, that's it. I'll do that. And, um, I don't even think I was getting paid to be honest with you or like they were just like paying for my food or something, you know, and, and like my bus spot. Um, and that was 2010. That's when I went out on the tour and, you know, I took a bus out to, uh, out to California and met up with everybody. And like, I, like there I was in the fairgrounds, you know, behind backstage where all the buses and everything are. And I'm like, just seeing all of my favorite bands, you know, are just hanging out back there. I'm going back and meeting with everybody and everyone's drinking and partying and smoking and, you know, doing drugs on the bus. So that's how I kind of got thrown into it is I was like, if I'm going to prove myself or like be cool to these people, like I got to catch up. And so here I am like that tour specifically every single morning, it's it's a if you could get through a warp tour, you could fucking do anything. Like that you wake up so early in the morning, you gotta set up like the merch tents and everything, uh, and then you go to production and production hands you like the set list of like all the bands, like the times that they play switch every single day. So you get a set list of like what time your band is playing and what stage and et cetera and all that. And then they hand you two cases of beer and one case of water. And the water, funny enough, that one of the major sponsors is Monster. And what Monster did is they put the water in Monster cans with the green M, like the black can with the green M, but like in little writing on the bottom, it said tour water. And that's what they gave the artists. But they did that as a branding tactic so that we'd be walking around drinking this water all day, but it looks like we're drinking Monster. So all the concert goers and all the attendees and everybody that are coming, the fans, they think we're drinking Monster all day. Genius branding. Yeah. But anyway, that's what they'd give us is one case of that water and two cases of beer every single day. So like I'm out in, you know, 110 degree weather and freaking vegas or you know wherever arizona uh, out on the west coast and i'm throwing bud lights in the cooler at 10 a.m and that's what i'm drinking all day you know out in the sun at 19 years old they're not checking my id or anything you yeah know, you're, on, you're on tour you're part of the tour you know um so i'm drinking all day and i'm getting tired what do i remember Gives me a little pick me up, the Adderall script that I got when I was eight years old. You know, <laughs> been taken for eleven years of my life, so I'll take a little bit of that. Aside from the amount that I was already taken, so I get a little more of a pick me up, and then I discover cocaine on that tour. And then before I knew it, two weeks into that tour, I spent three days completely awake getting no sleep, completely sunburned, not even phased by it. And I'm like in a psychosis. I'm losing my mind because I haven't slept. And there was a guy on that tour, and I'm not going to name him. A lot of people in that community know who this person is, though. And he's done a lot of fucked up shit in the music industry and in that world specifically. And I was, I was helping out his band a little bit. 
uh, doing some stuff for them. And uh, he introduced me to Percocets. And he was like, you'll get a little energy from these, but inevitably if you take enough of them, they'll help you fall asleep. So that's what I did. I spent all the money I had and bought those pills from him and got some sleep. And then I kind of found my regiment, if you will. You know, I was my, my own pharmacist and figured out, well, if I take this at this time and I drink this at this time, et cetera, et cetera, like, you know, became wow. a chemist myself. And uh, that was the beginning of a very dark few years of my life. Um, was that tour warp tour 2010 how long was that tour <clears throat> that tour is about like it's like two months long wow yeah and you're playing different city every day yeah. pretty much like every major market in the united states you know is it still going on no it ended man it ended the last full u.s run was in 2018 and then they did uh about four or five shows in 20. 20- 19 uh just so they could say they did 25 years it ran 25 years but that was the first concert i went to without like my parents in 2003 i went with my sister and i had never missed one since 2003 i yeah. went every single year and then i was a part of it you know in 2010 and um so you didn't do the tour the next year no no i was on a different tour uh in in the summer of 2011 um 2011 was very cool I, that was like my first international experience getting to go around the world and and do tours um who is what i i know who with who or no um a lot of different bands that i was working for there was a you know a, a heavier band called alisana that i worked for uh there's a christian band called the rocket summer that i was working with um okay yeah some local bands here as well uh Later on, you know, the last like real job I had, I was uh, doing like production stuff for 30 Seconds to Mars, uh-huh. um, which was cool. But, um, dude, that's, I mean, that's pretty fascinating. You know, honestly, the, the, just the story in and of itself of like, you know, you were a basketball player, got injured picked up the big bass drum yeah and then find yourself because it really wasn't that what was it three or four years you went from that to touring on tour tour the world yeah yeah i mean that's yeah that's that's pretty fascinating what um do you talk to anybody anymore from those days or no yeah quite a few Uh uh-huh you know i feel like there was a lot of amends i had to make oh interesting whether it was like all in my head, you know, or not, like whether I'd actually harmed somebody or done wrong by somebody. A lot of these people, I'm like, Hey, I I just want to apologize for who I was back then. And they're just like, okay, you, you were cool. We don't, you know, we don't care. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I just felt like an idiot, but um, do you have any, any drive to do that again? Yeah. Anything like it? Well, I do. You know, and so that's the cool part about this. So, so I'll get to, you know, I'll get to the sad part of the recovery story, you know, the brought to my knees part. Okay. Um, I had given up on doing the heavier drugs and I found myself back in a place where like most Americans, I guess, if you will, uh, that aren't in recovery, you know, that are normal, if you will, they you know, drink on the weekends and smoke pot every day. Right. That's just like, yeah, most people. Right. Mm-hmm. That's kind of where I was. Um, and this is like 2014, you know, this is after uh, a failed suicide attempt. Um, I don't really want to get too much into that. Story, no, that's but, fine. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was a heavy, you know, heavy time in my life. And, uh, this After, is 2014. This so. is pr- prior to, so, so okay. 2012. You know. 2012. So two um, years after. Yeah, the- about a year and a half after failed suicide attempt. Um, you know, life isn't unmanageable. I was selling car insurance. I was still playing music. Like, I had friends and everything. You know, I had 
a partner and life seems okay but like the voices and you know the the self-doubt and all like uh being in a crowded room and feeling all alone you know like that was that was all still there and um i was miserable and i can't really specifically say it was the substances that were making me feel that way um but i knew that something had to change and at the time i had friends that were in recovery and they were in this punk rock band called violence and um i had a little music studio that they used to play shows at all the time and i just hit them up and i'm like man i i don't know what's wrong with me like i just don't want to be here anymore here and, meaning alive. And, like on earth alive yeah. i just don't yeah like i just don't find the value in my life you know and and uh you guys just seem so happy and i want what you have and that's you know attraction rather than promotion you know what i mean right and uh, i'm like what what can i what should i do and these guys brought me to they brought me to my first meeting you know 12 step meeting and uh that was like a lot of people have that experience walking into your first meeting it's like you hear everything you need to hear and it's almost as if you feel like the everyone in that meeting was prefaced with your story because it's, it feels like they're talking directly to you. I walk into this meeting and I'm hearing like everything that I'm feeling and I'm hearing how people got themselves out of that feeling, you know? And I'm just like, man, this is kind of crazy. One of those spiritual experiences, if you will. And, um, I remember leaving the meeting and, people coming up and saying like, welcome, you know, nice to meet you. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't have a problem with drugs. I just smoke pot every now and then. And you know, like <laughs> I'm good, I'm good. It's, it's all good. But like, thanks for having me here or whatever. And they're like, yeah, keep coming back. Keep coming back. You know, it's, it's all good. Keep coming back. And I did. And I just, the next day I hit another meeting and I didn't use drugs that day. I didn't smoke. And the next day and the next day and the next day, and before I know it, I hit like 20 meetings in a row and like, I'm on fire about AA. And to be honest with you, I know like, you know, I'm not supposed to talk about it, but I feel like the book was written so long ago and the principles were written so long ago. I feel like with the way that technology is these days and like how, how much this message is needed to get out there. I do. I, I openly talk about my recovery and I feel like people should recover out loud, you know, if they're in a 12 step based program, you know, what do you mean by that? When you said, I don't, I know we're not supposed to talk about this, you know, in AA they, it's alcoholics anonymous. So yeah. you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to talk about being in the program, right? You know, you're Anonymity supposed to and- not say like, <laughs> I'm in alcoholics anonymous. You're supposed to say, you know, I'm in a fellowship or, you yeah. know, something like that. Right. But like, that shit saved my fucking life, man. So like, yeah, I'm going to promote it, you know? Well, and that's the thing. And just so you know, and I, I you, we didn't talk about this before, but Ben and I don't subscribe to that. You know, we, as a matter of fact, we just got done a few weeks ago doing a full 12, uh, about 12 week series on the steps where we broke down each step, you know? So I get that. I understand that, but in the end, it's not, it's not something that we're, I don't sign on to that. Sure. You know, AA at this point has saved millions of people's lives, you know, social media and everything is, it, it's, 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 it's not going away. Why wouldn't, like you said, we need to recover out loud. Yeah. You know, I, I, I believe in that wholeheartedly, but go ahead. Yeah. So I was on fire about it, you know, and I, uh, I got a sponsor and I remember sitting down and doing my first step and looking at him and saying, regardless of a substance problem, I feel like everyone in the world should do these steps. Yeah. Just like cleanse themselves of like everything Yeah, and, you know, learn how to live in the present you know, and just practice it every single day. Um, I was very infatuated with it. And just like anything else in my life, like you said, you know, basketball was my thing forever. Then drumming, I picked that up so quickly. 
then drugs and alcohol i picked that up so quickly and went like i go hard with everything yeah you know and this was my new thing and i knew i didn't want to be the guy that was hanging out with all the other guys that were newcomers i was like i need to i want to be with the clique you know that has got years of sobriety that are like doing the thing right and so i forced my way in and I, you know, I would reach out to people that had years of time and, and I'd just say like, Hey, what are you doing this weekend? And they'd say like what they're doing. And I'm like, cool, I'll be there <laughs> whether they invited me or not. <laughs> you know, I just, I showed up. I had a, a good friend of mine. I'm not going to say his name, but a good friend of mine who unfortunately was on house arrest uh, early in my sobriety. And I, I would call him and be like, hey, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm at the house. And I'm like, yeah, I know you are, motherfucker. I'm coming over. <laughs> you know, like, just go and hang out with him. And other guys would come and hang out. And, you know, it was, I learned how to have fun in sobriety. Yeah. I didn't know that was a thing. I, I didn't realize, like, how much more fun I could have by not obsessing over getting wasted, you know? And um, and to be honest with you, I never really liked drinking to begin with. That was never my serious issue. Um, I can't recall a single time that I was like wasted and I was like, this is awesome. Every single time it's like, I feel like shit. This sucks. I want to throw up. I don't want to feel this way anymore. Um, but that community that I found it finally made me feel like I wasn't all alone. Cause like back to that feeling I was saying before, like I, I was always the guy in a crowded room of people. Everybody knew me, you know, and I just always felt alone. Felt like people didn't understand me and I didn't know what was going on and why I felt this way. Um, and then through doing the steps and then through doing them again and working with other guys and just continuing to hear other people's stories and messages. Like I just, I was so infatuated with the idea of helping others like achieve this feeling of freedom. And, um, I started working in treatment in 2015, uh, as a tech, you know, and like quasi admissions guy. And still to this day, my favorite job I ever had, like working hand in hand with the clients and like, taking them to meetings and like seeing the light turn on or, you know, the thrill of like AMA blocking, you oh, know, just yeah, like yeah. somebody who's like on the edge, like, oh, I don't want to do this. I want to go home or I want to go get high and just like doing everything you possibly can to get them to realize like that's a horrible decision. And, and then like them coming to terms with it and agreeing with you and staying is like an unbelievable feeling to help somebody. Sure. And uh, I did that for a while. And, you know, this, especially down here in South Florida, like there's been a lot of ugliness in the treatment industry. Mm -hmm. Probably not for some time now. Things have cleaned up. I'm really proud of us down here. Um, but around this time, it was like very bad. And uh, our state attorney, you know, made it uh made it a point to like really get out there and start cracking down on people that were doing some unscrupulous stuff and some bad actors that were in this in the space unbeknownst to me at the time i was working for like one of the worst fucking treatment centers out there and um and i will say their name it was called chapters and before that it was called like good futures or something like that they had changed their name because they had a bad reputation and they were doing not so great things and they're not open anymore. No, yeah. no, no, no. Um, but I'm at this place and, you know, a few days into being at this place, cops fucking come knocking on the door and take everyone's computers. And like, it was like a whole big thing. And a few people got arrested. Was this in Delray? This was in Delray. Yeah. I remember this. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, at the time, I'm like a admissions guy, you know? Yeah. I don't understand patient brokering or like any of these things, you know, or like the the lab testing, like all the stuff, you know, like at the time. You at the time. I didn't right. I didn't I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And I also didn't get like why it was bad, you know, like I didn't understand any of it really. Yeah. 
you know, like I said, unbeknownst to me, it's like all these people that I looked up to in AA for so long are like the guys doing this stuff. Well, not, I want to pause you there real quick. Don't lose your train of thought, though, because, again, there's a correlation there with what you were saying with the tour stuff, I think. All the people that you had looked up to, you know, all your um, heroes heroes in the music in industry, yep. now you're on tour with them. And now, granted, I'm, they weren't like as bad of people as you know, the patient brokers and stuff like that, that was taking place here, but you saw their true colors coming out and kind and then fast forward same to, thing. yeah, same thing. All these guys that I looked up to that, like, I will still give them credit for saving my life. Yeah. Same here. Yeah. They were doing all this stuff mm-hmm. that like was bad. Yeah. Um, really bad really bad but also some of it still frustrates me because like were they making money off this stuff yeah but also some of these people that did get in trouble for this saved so many people's lives yeah i agree you know that's like the shitty part about it is like were they cheating the system and like robbing insurance companies yeah yeah But also, aren't the insurance companies robbing us all the time, too? (laughs) You know what I mean? Man, how much do I pay for health insurance and then I can't get a procedure done because they just won't do it or my deductible or et cetera, et cetera, you know? How many times we have to fight with insurance companies to, like, literally try to save our lives, you know? Well, even in the treatment space. Even in the treatment space. You know, they're authorizing days of treatment, et cetera. You know, it's so it's like. Or they are authorized a day and then you get, they reimbursed you for that day and it's like $50. Right. So I'm not (laughs) advocating for doing anything illegal, but like also. Yeah. You know. You set the tone. You think about that stuff as well. But, but yeah, like I said, some of these, some of these guys that got in trouble, absolutely fuck them. You're right absolutely terrible people they did horrible horrible things unspeakable things disgusting things but some of these people that got in trouble they were just making they were making a lot of money but they were also like some of the people that lived in their sober homes and you know like went to treatment and they got paid for yeah these people's lives changed Mm -hmm. and like they saved their lives you know and a lot of people would advocate for that too. Um, yeah. I don't want to name anybody or anything, but like I've, I've been feeling that way about it, but at the time, regardless working for this place, you know, all this stuff is coming to light. I'm starting to understand a bit of it. I decide to stay there after, even after the cops come in and take everyone's computers and arrest a few people, the clinical team was like, Hey, we still have clients to treat here. And like, we're going to, we're going to turn this place around. And I'm like, you know what? I'll, I'll be a part of the change. You know, let's make this place great. Probably about two months into the doing that where now I'm, I'm wearing so many hats at this place. I'm, I'm running groups without like any degree or really ability to be able to do so, you know, (laughs) running, running groups, doing intakes. I'm, I'm overseeing housing. I'm like doing so much for this place. I'll never forget this day, man, and and it haunts me to this day. But it was such a driving force for like what I would do in the future after this. But I had this girl come in and I was doing her intake. And she was she was inebriated. She was messed up. It took me almost two hours to do this girl's intake just because it took her so long to answer the questions because she was just not in her right mind. And we were in outpatient center, PHP IOP. Mm. So she in theory should have been in detox. A hundred percent. Yeah. There's no <clears throat> way that we should be taking this client into our care. And I get through the intake and I go to the clinical director and I give her my opinion. We should not take this client. She needs a higher level of care. Like this is kind of insane that we're even considering this. And that clinical director told me to stay in my lane and do my job as I'm told. And that she'll do her job and make that decision. And I said, okay. And we ended up taking that client in and she AMA'd that night and overdosed and died. Mm. 
And I remember coming in the next day overwhelmed with like anger, so much anger, not just that like this clinical director and this facility, but like now it was like my eyes were open to all of it. Maybe I was in denial about it for a while, especially because some of my friends were the guys that were getting in trouble for some of this stuff, you know, and it's like people I looked up to. But now I'm just so angry at the whole system. And I don't know how I came to this decision, but for some reason I just decided, like, first of all, I quit that day. I put in my two weeks and they didn't even, you know, I didn't even, I wasn't even going to take the two weeks. I just respectfully put in my two weeks. Um, and I decided like, I just want to help people. I don't know what that looks like right now, but I know of a way to reach a lot of people and it's through music. And maybe that doesn't look like me writing music and saying something, but maybe that looks like me going back out on tour to the very place that fucking brought me to my knees and sharing a message of hope with all of the people that are there, whether they're working for the tour and on the tour or just an attendee and a fan. And so I had this idea to go back out on Warp Tour and just like try to get on stage and share like a bit of my story with all of the fans. But then at the same time, talk to all of the bands and the crew and like people f- people forget about the crews a lot like the techs and the merch guys and like the light guys and the you know the tour managers and like the people that make the show really happen you know like people just think about the band but like man some of the loneliest people in the world are these guys that work for bands that get no credit for anything And they really don't have any family or friends because they're constantly on the road. And their only friends or family are the people that they live in a bus with, you know. And they get credit from those people, but it's like no one else knows who they are. No one else knows the grind that they're doing, and they're miserable. It's a sad fucking life. Touring sucks. Most people that tour would tell you that. Um. You know, especially like people that aren't the artists, people that work for the artists, you know? Yeah. And um, I figured I, I want to help these people and I want to show them like I was once like them, you know, maybe not to a super extent, but like I was in that position and this is where I'm at now <laughs> and you can make it out. Um, And that's all about mental health, man. You know, at this point in my recovery, like I discovered, like it was never really the substances that were the problem. They were just my solution. The problem's always been me. You know, if I look at the real problem, it's, you know, parents got divorced when I was two, got diagnosed with like ADD and depression at the age of eight and put on medication, developed trichotillomania and start pulling my hair out at like the age of nine, 10 start getting made fun of at school because I got bald spots. So then I start wearing a hat to school, which is like a, you know, catch 22, like lose, lose situation because nobody else is allowed to wear a hat to school, but the principal let me because I was getting made fun of. So then I got made fun of even more because I was wearing a hat or not wearing a hat. So then kids would steal the hat and they see the bald spots. I had no identity as a kid. I played basketball, sure, but, like, I wasn't always the best basketball player. You know, I I chameleonized myself to every single group. I was friends with the jocks. I was friends with the nerds. I was friends with the skaters. I was friends with everybody just because I, I didn't know who I was or what I wanted to be. I just wanted to fit in always. But still felt lost and alone, you know, and I felt, I felt like that's how a lot of people end up on tour and doing that stuff. And they feel that way. They feel like they're in the background and they don't really have a voice, you know? So in this thought process of wanting to go back out on tour and share a message and, and be like a voice of hope for people that are like on the road. Um, I thought about how can I get people to be vulnerable and share their adversities of mental health struggles, you know, 
because there's such a stigma behind it. So I decide to write out my story from two years old all the way till that day of where I've been at in my journey and my recovery process and like how, what led me to the point that I had gotten to and how I got out of it. And I shared that on social media and I don't know what really drove me to do that, but just, I had an urge to do it and it, it got such a response. Like, you know, people were, a lot of people were reaching out to me. It blew up on social media, if you will, LinkedIn and, and Facebook and, um, a lot of people reaching out to me saying, I want to share my story too. You should build a platform to be, for people to be able to do this. And uh, so I started I started it as a project. It's called it Finding a Lost Voice. And that's what I was going to do on Warp Tour. And I reached out to Kevin Lyman, the founder of Warp Tour, and I was just like, Kev, I'm coming out on tour. And like, I don't know what I'm doing yet, but I just like want to talk to people. And he's like, I can't pay you, and I can't give you a place to live but i could give you a pass to come come on you know come in every day i'm like sure i flew out to seattle i rented an suv threw a baby mattress in the back seat and i drove myself around the country for i didn't do the entire tour i did six weeks of the tour and every single day i'd get on stage and i'd speak in front of tens of thousands of kids share about five to 10 minutes of my recovery story. You know, I was an addict. I was just like you guys. I found peace by coming to concerts. It was an escape for me. Um, you're, you're not alone in whatever adversity you might be going through. Doesn't have to be substances, body dysmorphia, anxiety, depression, anything that you might be feeling. And you think that you're the only one that's feeling it. Trust me, you're not. There's many other people that feel the exact same way that you are. And if you need help, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to help you. And then I realized, oh, shit, like I need resources for these people. You <laughs> I, know? Like, say the same. <laughs> I need resources for these people. And, uh, you know, that was like day two overwhelming amount of people coming up to me sharing their stories and i'm like man like this is kind of fucked up i need to <clears throat> help these people find help and so i was thinking about it and i'm like man when i was a kid my mom took me to therapy and i went to fau for therapy and it's because we couldn't afford it we couldn't afford therapy but they have master's level psychologists there that need a certain amount of hours of yeah talk therapy with people to graduate so it's like sliding pay scale we paid like 10 bucks a session so I start going to universities with master's level psychology programs and I'm talking to their psych professors and I'm like, Hey, if I have people to refer to you, like how do, how does that process work? And then I start going to other hospitals with psych units and talking to case managers and people there. Like now I know them as case managers at the time. I'm just, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just reaching out to anybody and everybody that works in mental health. Yeah. And I'm going to indigent programs and I'm going to privately funded programs. And I'm just Googling anything I could that's in within like a 20 mile radius of the fairgrounds of Warp Tour. And so half of my day is spent talking to the kids and, and people at Warp Tour. And then the other half of the day is spent going and meeting with all anybody and everybody I could that is a mental health provider of sorts in that area. So I'm gaining access to people that I could, ref, you know, refer patients to or people to in general all around the country. And then at night, go back to Warp Tour and help run and facilitate 12 step based meetings for for the bands and the crew on one night. And then the next night we would do a guided meditation and we would switch it every other night. And so, like, I had several people on the tour that got sober and would attend these meetings. And then I had other people that had, didn't have interest in being sober but, like, loved the idea of meditating and, like, calming down at the end of, like, a long-ass day. And so I got very close with all the people that were on the tour, you know, as well as we would invite some of the concert, like, the fans and stuff that were cool to come and be a part of those meetings as well. And so... I'm doing all of this advocacy work, not realizing that like I'm pretty much doing business development. <laughs> yeah. And 
my buddy Josh Fenster, who owns Seacrest Recovery Center, he was like, I want you to do business development for me. And at the time, I was so against the idea because all I knew about marketers and business development was like all of the bad things that all of them were doing down here. I didn't know that it was like something you could do. Legit. <laughs> Legitimately, yeah. right. right? Yeah. Um, and then he he's like, I don't think you realize, but you're already doing it. You know? Mm-hmm. He's like, if a client is a good fit for our program, great. If they're not, keep doing what you're doing and referring them to somebody that they can get the help from. And then maybe those people will refer us business. Maybe they won't, but it's getting our name out there. And that's what business development is. And so I worked for Seacrest recovery center for about a year doing business development there. And, um, you know, I wanted to build like a music program and I wanted to do more with like national touring and doing all of that stuff. And at the time Seacrest was a small, out of network IOP in Florida. They had no other facilities yet. And so I felt like I needed something bigger and I reached out to Banyan and went and worked for Banyan for three years with all these ideas of opening a music program there, which they were excited about. Never happened. Uh, you know, and um going and, and doing like sober activations and and like mental health activations at these music festivals, setting up a tent that is Banyan branded passing out our stuff, you know, as a resource for them, but not the only resource for them and still running the meetings, you know, and, and I started doing this at big festivals nationally. I started infiltrating the music industry in a way that nobody else really was doing as like the mental health guy. You know, I don't want you to listen to any of my music. I'm not trying to ask you for anything. I'm really just offering something to you as a resource for your artists or people that work for your company. So I'm going to record labels and management agencies and even musical instrument companies. I went to NAM, which is the national association of music merchants. And they have like two huge con- or conventions every year. And I'm like meeting with people that are like the CEO or COO of these huge musical instrument companies and saying like, Hey, you guys offer health benefits for your employees what do you guys do if an employee is struggling with their mental health or an employee's family member is struggling with their mental health and they happen to be on the health benefits that you guys offer? Oh, we don't really know. And I'm like, well, that's cool. Why don't you have me come in and talk to your HR department about meeting with the leaders of these certain departments of your company and talking to the employees about mental health? Wouldn't you rather somebody go and get help for 30, 60, 90 days and then come back and still be the, you know, an even better employee for you than to have to go hire somebody else and train them, et cetera, et cetera. And like have constant turnover when don't you want to help your own, you know, nine and 0.5 times out of 10, the answer is yeah. And so I start doing a lot of that with, with Banyan and going and doing that type of advocacy work. And I just fell in love with it, you know? Um, so that's kind of how I got into this industry. You know, now I'm back at Seacrest. Now Seacrest has grown. We have still the flagship down here in Florida, PHP IOP, but now we have New Jersey, we have Columbus and and uh Cincinnati and Ohio. Um it's kind of nice to be back in my roots, you know, where I started and yeah. they've grown and I've grown and now we're helping each other. Are they allowing you to do anything inside of the music industry? Or is that something that you, are you trying to do that still or like, uh, well, I mean, I'll, I'll always do that. Yeah. You know, it's not my main focus anymore. Um, you know, I still work with certain artists on like a coaching level now. I like started so- to, sober coaching type deal. Yeah. So more like mental health coaching, yeah, mental you know, health, yeah. um, like I said, my whole story has really always been like mental health and, you know, we talked a little bit about this too, is like, uh, and I'll get into that part of the story in a second, but, um, yeah, I do mental health coaching with some artists that are on tour and I'll go out for a couple days at the beginning of their tour and work with them and, and everybody that's a part of their team, uh, you know, their band and the crew and everybody and kind of like give them some tools yeah, to work on while they're on tour. And then I talk to them every single day virtually, you know, on the phone or zoom or, or FaceTime 
Um, and then I go back in the middle of the tour and kind of see where they're at with everything, see if we could course correct or fix some things. A lot of easy practices like pits and peaks, you know, pits and peaks. No pits and peaks is like a cool practice in a group of people where like you kind of go around in a group in a circle and, and each person says like the worst part about their day and then the best part about their day. So their pit and their peak. Right. Right. And you usually do it about like the day before. So you talk about the, the, the previous day and you're like yesterday this happened and it sucked and this happened and it was awesome. And you kind of, everybody in the room processes what sucked about your day and kind of tells you like what your part in it might be, you know, and how you can avoid that in the future or kind of turn it into a positive, Mm -hmm. you know, and then peaks, you know, how do you keep riding that high and like staying excited about that? You know, it's all just a positive practice more so about being present, you know, but talking about your prior day and how we can, learn from that moving forward and uh the, real quick on that and the just from a band's perspective or a, or an artist's perspective they don't probably have any real time uh, not that they don't have time to do that i mean obviously anything that you're that you want to that's important you're going to prioritize time for but i'm just thinking in terms of without you kind of bringing light to that specific situation by way of your own story, they're probably not going to come to that conclusion. Like, Hey, maybe we should all get together for an hour a day and do pits and peaks or whatever the case is, because it's going to not only make our us better and more tolerable. Cause I'm sure that people amongst these bands, there's and the a crew lot of different personalities, stuff, man. Yeah. They probably are they fighting. Yeah. yeah. You know, and these are the people that you're stuck with for weeks, weeks and months, months on at end. a time. Yeah. Right. You know, so you got to be a, a tight unit. Yeah. If one person's not doing good, it brings everybody else down. So if one person's not doing good, but everybody else has tools and resources to be able to help that person. Right. Then you kind of, you're all just helping each other constantly, you know, and being there for each other and open and honest about how you're feeling. Right. Because a lot of people are afraid to talk about how they're feeling, feeling like they're alone in that, you know, but everyone's feeling the same way. You know, to I have to be led to believe, too, that that stuff will translate into the actual show. You know, like if you have a I'm this is not my world, but I could imagine if you got a drum player and a guitar player that are not that hate each other for whatever yeah. reason, like it has to translate. That energy definitely translates. And then it the translates show. to the to the concert goers and stuff like that. So, I mean not only on a personal level is this so important just for your overall well-being, but I mean, a lot of stuff as we're seeing rides on this stuff, Yep, you know, it, cause it translates in, and this isn't just the music industry. This, this holds true to anything really. I mean, if you think about it, if you, that's why we always say, you know, you can't give what you don't have. Right. You know, and if I'm, if I'm, even here at rock, I'll tell you if, if myself and Ben or which me and Ben, we get into our little spats, but whatever. But like if the clinical team and the operations team aren't okay, it's felt amongst the whole community. The clients know it yep. like it's, it's something that, so anyways, that's it's energy. Of, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's you energy. gotta, it's gotta be at the forefront. And I think that, so anyways, I cut you off. I don't know if you still remember where you were heading with that, but um, the mental well, health you, you were asking, you know, if I'm, if I'm still doing the stuff in the music industry and like, yeah, it's not really to the extent as it was, you know, I've got a family now, you know, I, yeah. I have, I have a five and a half year old little boy. He's an amazing little kid. And like, I, I just love being able to spend time with him. Now I've got a six month old little girl. <laughs> you know, yeah. and that's, that's a whole lot, you know, in it of itself. And yeah. I have a partner and, you know, I've got my family here and, you know, while working at Banyan, probably two years into it, my mom had gotten sick, uh, diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And like at the time I was traveling so much and I really didn't want to be traveling as much because I wanted to stay close to home to be there for her, you yeah. know, and help her. And, um, so like I slowed down with a lot of that stuff. You know, um, 
Is well, your mom, did your mom pass away or? No, man. Oh, no, no kidding? She beat the shit out of cancer, man. Good for her. Yeah. Nice. She beat the shit out of cancer. It's it's awesome. She's Stage three, four lung three, cancer. Three years in remission. Wow. I'll never forget sitting with her in that doctor's office when the doctor was talking to me about it. And I, you know, I'm obviously overwhelmed and crying and yeah. I'm like, what are her chances? You know? And this guy like really couldn't even look me in the eyes because like, you know, he felt like, I don't know what to say to this guy, but like not a lot of people come back from this. Yeah. Man, my mom's a fucking champ. Oh, yeah. And you know what's funny about that is, like, not even funny. It's just such an incredible story, and and part of why we've connected on the level that we have, too, is Charlie, you know? Yeah. And uh, I was hoping we were going to get dur- Well, during this time... Drop my vape. Um, during this time, I had just met Charlie. Uh-huh. And... I appreciate you. Um, I had just met Charlie. Funny how I met him, man. But like, my my good friend posted him on Instagram, and I I you know heard what he said on this on this story, and I then I went on his page and I follow his page, and I'm watching his videos, and I'm like, man, this guy's really inspiring. And I told myself, I'm like, I'm gonna meet this guy, and I'm gonna be friends with him. And uh, lo and behold, like a week later. I'm doing an intervention for an artist out in California and I'm working with this artist team, you know, his manager and the record label and everybody. And somebody says the word, like somebody says winning streak or winning or something like that. And I just say, I'm on a winning streak, which is something Charlie says, you know, that's his, that's his whole thing. And one of the other people goes, that's Charlie's phrase. And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, do you know him? And he's like, yeah, he's a good friend of mine. I was like, man, I'm dying to meet him. He's like, oh, I'll FaceTime him right now. I'm like all excited. He FaceTimes Charlie. Charlie gets on the phone. And Charlie goes, hey, Jordan, it's nice to meet you, man. I heard you give people winning streaks for a living. And I was like, you know what, Charlie? The only way that I could stay on my winning streak is by giving other people theirs. Mm. And he was like, damn, that's hard. He's like, I like that. He's like, I like where your head's at. I want you to come visit me in Atlanta. I'll fly you out. Let's like work on some stuff. And I'm like, cool. And at the time, like he's trying to develop this mission, you know, the dream machine. And he had already done a lot of it touring with the, the van and, you know, paying for people's mortgages and like people's cancer treatments and things like that. Just like such an inspiring person, man. He, he, you know, we could t- this could be an entire podcast about Charlie, you know, and his whole story. But like the short version of it is, you know, he's a former music mogul that discovered some of our favorite artists today, one being Two Chains and some others that got diagnosed with a brain tumor and pivoted his life from the music industry into becoming a healthy person and like a positive person for other people. And, you know, he beat his brain tumor by getting healthy. And, uh, you know, losing a whole bunch of weight and, like, riding his bike around, like, across America. He rode his bike across America. I didn't know he did that. Like, he's just always doing incredible things. Very inspiring person. So so he says, you know, he wants me to fly out to Atlanta so we could talk and see how we could work together on some things. Maybe I could help him with building his nonprofit organization. And the day that I'm supposed to fly out, or like two days before I'm supposed to fly out is when my mom called me and said, I'm not feeling too good. I'm going to go to the hospital. And my mom's been a nurse for 35 years. She usually takes care of herself. So if she's going to the hospital, I know it's serious. So I go and meet her at the hospital and they found a mass in her lung. And um, I was like, I'm supposed to leave in a couple days to go to Atlanta. I'm going to cancel my trip. But in the hospital, the whole time I'm telling my mom about Charlie and she's like, I don't think that's a good idea. I think if there's anybody that you need to be with right now, it's somebody like him. Whether we get a positive or negative, you know, test back on my biopsy, whether it's cancer or not, we didn't know at the time still. You should go be with Charlie. And I was like, all right. So I flew up there and I'm with Charlie. And we're spending the day together and we're, we're talking about ideas. We went to like a WeWork and we're writing on a board of like things that we could do to go out there and help people and inspire people. And then I get the call from my sister 
and she's just crying her eyes out. She's like, yeah, mom has cancer and they think it's stage four. And I just like felt all of my energy just gone. Like I was just felt completely defeated. And Charlie's like, let's forget about all this right now. Let's go for a walk. And I don't know if you've been to Atlanta. You've been to Atlanta. No. There's this, this like loop, this walk in Atlanta called the Beltline. It's like a cool, like it's like a park, mm-hmm. different restaurants, and it's just a cool area to go walk around. So we're walking around the Beltline, and Charlie's just like trying to, he's trying to get me out of this funk. He's trying to get me motivated to be there for my mom. And he's like, has your mom ever had any surgeries before? Anything major medically? And I'm like, yeah, she's been in the hospital a lot of times. Probably I think I texted my mom and I'm like, how many surgeries have you had? And she said, 16. And that's like kidney stones, adhesions. She had her spleen removed, her appendix removed, her tonsils removed, like all this you know, stuff. She's just always had medical problems, right? So she's not a stranger to this. So Charlie's like, man, 16 times she's been under the knife. He's like, I'm not really a betting man, but if I was, I'm betting on the team that's 16 and 0 to go 17 and 0. He's like, your mom's going 17 and 0, man. And he's like, I want to hear you say it. 17 and 0. Oh, yeah. 17. And he just starts pumping me up. I start saying 17 and 0. And we call my mom and he gets on the phone with her and he's like, Debbie, you don't know me, but I'm here to tell you. That you're you're the champion. You're the championship team. You're gonna keep being undefeated. You're 16 and 0 right now. We're going 17 and 0. We're gonna kick cancer's ass. And then he got my mom to start chanting it. 17 and 0. 17 and 0. I think that's what saved my mom's fucking life, man. Mm. I might like cry saying this right now because it's it is overwhelming to think about, but it's. Yeah, it was like that motivation is what saved my mom's life. And we we got my mom eating healthier, and I did the same thing. We started eating healthier together. We bought this, like, vegan cookbook and stuff. And I was there for my mom. Another part of being in the treatment industry is learning about insurances, and there was, like, another thing that I was able to help my mom with at, at, at the hospital she was getting treatment from. Five or six months into her treatment, they told her that they weren't taking her insurance anymore and that the hospital was out of network now with United Healthcare and she only had an HMO. And so, like, I taught my mom about single case agreements and we fought with the hospital and United Healthcare for weeks until they finally agreed to give my mom a single case agreement. Yeah. And that's like something I learned from this industry, too, you know? Sure all of this stuff, you know, and this positivity and my mom's not always the most positive person, but about this and like, you know, what Charlie, like the mentality that he gave the winning streak mentality, you know, I have a tattooed on my hand. I think that's what saved my mom's life. But, um, you know, that toxic positivity, you know, that's what Charlie calls it. Toxic, toxic positivity. Um, but anyway, um, I don't know how we got on the Charlie topic and the music stuff, but like, again, the music stuff will always be like my, my mom getting sick. I took a step back from doing all the music stuff to the degree that I was and traveling as much as I was. And, uh, and then COVID happened anyway, you know, and nobody's traveling and then I'm stuck at home for months at a time, not really able to travel. And it gave me a lot of time to sit and think mm-hmm. about my life as a whole and where I'm at and a lot of the things I was thinking about is my relationship, you know, with my wife, my relationship with sobriety, what I'm doing for work, what I've been neglecting like passion wise music and things. And I take a look at all of these things and like I realize like I love my wife. But we're we're like we're homies now. It's not like an intimate relationship. It's you know, it's different, right? We're like 
co-parents. And um, I decided to end that, you know, end in my marriage. Um, we're cool now. You know, we've got a little boy. We co-parent with him, and she's still my friend. You know, it was just we grew apart. Um, my relationship with sobriety. I took a good look at why I was sober. And for me, I started believing I'm sober for everybody but me. I've put myself on this pedestal, Captain Recovery, out here talking to tens of thousands of people about mental health, but mentioning my sobriety in tandem with it. And I really took a look at, like, I'm sober because everybody's expecting me to be now. Mm -hmm. But was that actually really ever my issue or was it my mental health? Right. <clears throat> and where am I at with that? And how far have I come? Seven years of sobriety at this point. And I decided to have a drink. I just did like a complete 180 during COVID. You know, <laughs> something about being cooped up for that long and not like for years and years, constantly on the go, traveling, talking, doing all these things, not sitting with myself and thinking enough, you know, about me. And since having that drink, I could tell you, I could probably count twice on my hands and feet in the last three years how many times I've had a drink. It's not an issue for me anymore. Um, my mental health will always be an issue for me. I think not an issue, but like it'll always be a part of my life. And that's the thing that I need to continue to work on constantly. And so I've got a great therapist. I take a lot of the things that I've learned and practiced over the seven years of that sobriety and being away from substances. I have healthy solutions in my life today. Meditation, community, support, therapy. And so I took that step, you know, and I, and I tried it. And knowing in the back of my head, if this goes south, I know where to go and get help. Um, and I say that not to inspire anybody else to decide to go out and drink if they've got years of sobriety. That's their decision to make. But I say that because there's no one size fits all to any of this shit. Right. Did sobriety save my life? Did AA save my life? Absolutely. No doubt in my mind. Um, but I grew a lot since then, and I learned a lot since then. And so I personally made, I made a personal decision that I want to see if I can do that again and drink like a normal person. Been successful so far, you know? Um but for anybody listening to this, you know, I know this is a big recovery podcast. It's like I, I, I like that I can be honest about that and talk about that. A lot of people are afraid to. Yeah. A lot of people in our industry, especially, like I know plenty of people that. Yeah, they get down. They get down, man. They're not sober <laughs> yeah. anymore, you know, but yeah. they, they don't talk about it. Yeah. And um, I think it's, it's you know, the uh, as long as you can be honest with yourself. Sure and honest with everybody else and there's no fraudulence attached to it. Yeah. It's that fraudulence and lying that's going to eat eat at you and make it worse. Make it worse. Yeah. And have you inside your head and then and then that's what's going to get you to a point where you're going to have a drink for the wrong reasons. I told myself when I decided to start drinking that if I ever have a day where I'm like, man, it's been a long day, I could use a drink. That's the last 
point of when I should be having a drink, you know, like that's, yeah, that's not a reason to drink. Using it as an escape. Correct. Right. You know, this year I've had, man, three, four times that I've drank. My birthday, I had a couple drinks. My partner's birthday, I had a couple drinks. Fourth of July, maybe had a beer. It was just something that, again, you know, I, I, I told myself I was sober for everybody else but me. And, like, does alcohol really make my life any better? No. Right. But it was also one of those things where I was like, I also just don't want to feel like I can't. Well, and I honestly, Jordan, I respect that. And yes, this is a big, obviously, recovery podcast. But again, I'm more, you know, whatever floats your boat. Sure. You know, and honestly, like it, my opinion is it's, it's risky, but you haven't, you haven't, you haven't uttered the words like, You've you've basically alluded to the fact that you know that there's risk there and you're willing to take that risk, which is totally cool. I know for myself, I would love to be able to do that. Now, for me, my story is obviously a lot. Well, we're all cut from the same cloth, but my story is different. I literally could not get out of a bar. Sure. I was drinking more than most people, you know, so for me, it's kind of. Again, looking at risk versus reward for me, it's not. I just, you know, and I that's, choose. That's to, all it is. Yeah. I feel like so many people with years and years of sobriety. Yeah. At this point, they probably could go have a drink and it wouldn't affect them. But is it worth it to find out? Right. What's the risk worth the versus the re- reward? Right. You know, and yeah. Also, at this point in my life, you know, I'm about to be single for the first time in 10 years. Not now, but you were at the at, time in, during you know, COVID. Yeah. Right. You know, like I'm, I didn't want your girlfriend or partner partner yeah yeah well yeah right not now no i have a partner yeah Yeah. what are you talking about um no i i janice i love janice and um you know i love the family that we have now and um but prior to prior to janice and you know during covid and becoming single for the first time i was like man it's gonna be kind of difficult to get out there in the dating world you know yeah and that was like another part of the decision making process, you know, like, am I going to take this risk? Is the reward worth it? Right. You know, to not feel awkward if I'm going out on a date with somebody who's a normie and they're like, why don't you drink? And like, do I want to be the guy? Yeah. You know, that says it or do I want to risk it and see if I could do it? Right. I respect that. I took the risk, man. Yeah. You know, and, and, um, yeah, I'm not going to lie. There was definitely a couple weekends where I feel like maybe I drank a little too much. Yeah. And I was honest with myself. And I have the capability to be able to do that now. Yeah. And I was like, I'm not going to drink for a while. Went yeah. a little too hard this weekend. Did you notice that when when people... So we haven't spoken in a long time. Um, so I didn't know. I mean, I knew this was part of your story prior to press and record, but... You know, we don't talk on the regular basis. So I didn't know that this was going to be part of your story. But honestly, again, like for me, the podcast is open conversation. Like I want people to be able to be honest. And but my question for you, and we got to wrap up, but we got about five minutes left. Um, Did people, did you notice anybody kind of like, ugh, Jordan? Oh, absolutely, man. See, that's that's it broke my heart a few times. There was one in particular person that I had helped get sober and they had been sober for probably like a year at this point. And I got honest with this person and I said, hey, I'm I'm drinking again. And they acted, you know, like it was okay. But then a couple days later called me and said, you know, when you when those words came out of your mouth, it's almost as if I felt like you died. Whoa. And I was like, wow, like that's how much like you're dead to me type. No, no. Like, like, like you're just oh, like you died. Yeah. That fucked me up, you know, and I was like, man, and that's that's like another 
you know, like I, like I expressed, like I had put myself on this pedestal as like Captain Recover. So many people looked up to me yeah, because of how outspoken I was about sobriety, but it, it was never really about sobriety. It was about mental well-being. Right. That's always been my message, especially on the Warp Tour. It's always been any kind of mental health adversity. Substance use is a byproduct of mental health adversity. Right. I truly don't believe anybody's ever had like drugs have ever been somebody's problem. They are people's solution to the real problem. Right. And that's why mental health advocacy is so important to me because it's it's almost like the pre-work. It's like uh, harm reduction. It's like talk about mental health and fixing that first and then maybe substances don't ever become a problem. And um, but but yeah, it did affect me in certain ways where i realized like this isn't something that i'm gonna just come out and be public about and be like i'm drinking now you know which who should do that anyway but yeah the few some some people i told you know yeah kind of tossed me out of their life and uh that hurt for sure um but i still got love for them you know and, uh, and i'm still proud of them and and they're on their journeys and they're doing their thing um yeah some people definitely feel weird about it uh, that's okay. Who cares? Everyone's entitled to their opinion. Yeah. You know what? The single most important thing I learned in recovery is that I still practice every single fucking day of my life is that I don't control anything at all except for this exact moment in time. My two hands, my two feet, and my fucking mouth. That is the only thing I control is this body, this mouth, and this moment in time. I don't control you. I don't control these listeners. I don't control the weather outside. I don't control the cars on the road. I have fucking no control over anything at any moment in time except for right now and my own person. And I have to accept that. Everything else is what I like to call God. In my relationship with God, I'm not a religious person. I'm a very spiritual person, but God is every single thing that I am not in this exact moment in time. Yeah. The future doesn't exist. It's fake. I don't know if I'm going to wake up tomorrow. I hope that I do. And the past can't be changed. So why the fuck do I waste my time thinking about it, dwelling on it, thinking I could do, could have been, should have been, would have been, whatever's. So in terms of people's feelings about me and my decision to drink again or whatever I do with my life, that's okay. I don't control them. It's not going to change my opinion about them. I still got love for everybody. It's just acceptance of I don't have control over the way that people are going to feel about this. I only have control over my feelings and I'm okay with myself either way. Damn, man. Well, listen, I, I, I want to go off and say this has been one of my favorite episodes. <laughs> and we're coming up on, you know what's crazy? You know what number episode this is? Huh. 300. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that until, wait, let me, hang on a second. 300. This is Sparta. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure, yeah, because t- 298 came out, what day is today? Wednesday. Wednesday. Came out today. 299 is going out. Next Wednesday? Next, no, this coming Sunday. Got it. So this will be next Wednesday, 300. Wow. That's awesome. That's cool. I'd love to come back. Dude, absolutely. We got to do episode two. Absolutely. I feel like we got more For to talk about. For sure. Because I, I want to hear more about you, man. I want to like talk to you. Have you, you know, ever thought about starting a podcast? So many people have told me I should. Well, here and here's why I say this. One, because obviously you have a hell of a story. Uh, two, you speak very well. Three, you present well. Four, you got your shit together. Like five, it's a very like you're already you know how to operate all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, like yeah. this isn't nothing. You know, when I started my podcast, it was I was literally. I'll say this. I I thought about it for a year and a half. I kind of knew I wanted to do it, but I was like overwhelmed with the whole tech side of it. Yeah. And then my buddy who was a DJ for way FM, uh, 
He's like, dude, just plug a microphone into your computer and record into GarageBand. Yeah. And I'm like, it is that simple. And no, I'm not kidding you. I was, I was sitting in my underwear and I was so frustrated with myself. And I, I recorded the very first episode. I'll tell you the exact date. Um, I'm so happy that you did. Dude. And, you know, like. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Why don't I just come back and, and we make this a two-parter? I'd be 300 and 301. The one I'm doing today is going to be. Um, we could do that. We can do that. You know who I'm recording with at one o'clock? Rabbi Mark. Oh, yeah, that's right. August. That's, that's going to be a good one. October 5th, 2017 is when I recorded the first one. Addiction wow. No More. Yeah. So anyways, man, like I said, dude, it's this has been awesome. Um, definitely have you come on. I don't care. You tell me you know, whenever, you know, whenever you want to come back up. Yeah, we'll, could get, be, we'll get Ben in here for, yeah. the, for the next one. Man, I wish he was in here for this one, but whatever. It's and cool. We talked a lot, man. People got to know a bit of my story, but. It's been an hour and, yeah, hour and 22 minutes. Yeah. Um. So, but anyways, yeah, have you on part two. Definitely. We got a lot more to cover. I love the message that you have. I, I definitely think you should start a podcast. That's a no brainer, um, especially for the, for you know, the amount of people that you already have reached, you know, and sure. like your network, you know, a lot of people. And yeah. Well, I mean, you know, if you go on my Instagram, like I've got a, an okay amount of followers and they're all riff raff fans. And, uh, my friend Tyler Nolan, who's like a famous tattoo artist and, and into like snakes and exotic animals. So I have the most interesting fan base on social media ever. Um, and riffraff because i write music with him but uh yeah so I, I don't know how much they would appreciate my podcast if i'm not just talking about riffraff things or yeah. snakes and stuff but yeah. but uh yeah i would love i would love to start a podcast man and uh, you right. know what i think you just inspired me to do it so super easy super easy which you know you could figure it out in a day and then i'll become completely obsessed with it probably but hey <laughs> Dude, talk to Seacrest too. You know, yeah. see if we'll it's something with them. Yeah. So, all right, man. Well, let's wrap this up, and uh, I'll see you on part two. All right. Yeah. I'll see you guys on part two. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Real Recovery Talk. In the end, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you could always reach myself or Ben Tom at realrecoverytalk.com and Ben at realrecoverytalk.com, and hopefully, we can help you turn your mess into your message. Right, Jordan? Yep. All right, that is it. We will see y'all later.